Last time, we left off wondering how our first binary classification tree would perform on real data. Inspired by our machine learning and statistics researchers, we chose to use a greedy approach to grow our tree. And at each level, we decided to choose the split that made the fewest misclassification errors on our training data. Let's split our data on the variable x0. So all our examples that have a value of 0 in this upper left position will move into our left node. And all examples with a 1 in this position will move into our right node. After splitting, we decided to assign each node the label that matches the majority of the examples it contains. The majority of the examples in our left node are negative, so we'll give it a negative label, resulting in a misclassification of the 424 positive examples in this node. Our right node also contains a majority of negative examples, so we'll also give this node a negative label, resulting in a misclassification of the 71 positive examples in this node. It may seem strange that we've assigned both nodes of our tree a negative label. It's not much of a tree. But remember that our greedy approach demands that we search for the best tree one level at a time. And the metric we've chosen to guide our search is the number of misclassifications we make when branching each node of our tree. Any other labeling of our two nodes will result in more misclassifications. We must label both nodes negative. Now the big question. Did our total number of errors go up, go down, or remain equal to our baseline of 495? If we add together the number of misclassifications in our left and right nodes, we get 495. So the total number of misclassification errors remained exactly the same after splitting on our upper left variable x0. Not a great outcome. But of course, this could be a result of our choice of pixel. Perhaps splitting on x0 is not the way to go. Now, what about splitting on our central variable x40? Once again, both nodes contain a majority of negative examples, meaning we misclassify all positive examples, resulting in a total of, you guessed it, 495 misclassification errors. In fact, no matter which pixel we split on, we end up with the same unremarkable result, 495 errors exactly the same number we started with. And remember that the whole purpose of counting up the number of misclassification errors after splitting on each pixel is to figure out which pixel to split on. So either all pixels are equally bad choices, which seems unlikely, or our method of choosing pixels is flawed. If we give some deeper thought to our majority class labeling system, we can see one reason all splits came out the same. Our data is imbalanced. We have way more negative non-finger examples than we have positive finger examples. Unless our first split creates a node with a majority of positive examples, we will continue to classify all fingers as non-fingers and make exactly 495 misclassification errors. Now, we could make our data more balanced by throwing away a bunch of our negative examples. But this really isn't an ideal solution. What we really need here is a more robust method for determining which split is best. Let's have a closer look at the results of our x40 and x0 splits. We know that they each make 495 misclassification errors, but is there any other evidence we can draw on to pick one split over another? One nice thing about our x40 split is that although both nodes are majority negative, it actually does begin to separate our data, especially our positive finger examples. Since most of our finger examples end up in our right node, this could be the root of a pretty terrific tree. What we need now is some mathematics to formalize our intuition. How should we measure how well our tree begins to divide our data? We would like to reward nodes that are like our left node on our x40 split that are highly concentrated or pure with respect to a single class. Let's borrow another idea from our researcher friends and create a measure of the impurity of each node. We could, of course, measure the purity instead, but measuring impurity will make things a bit simpler down the road. And choosing the split that minimizes node impurity should give the same results as choosing the split that maximizes node purity. To nail down the details here, let's head back to our toy data one last time. We'll construct one last toy data set that mimics the behavior we saw on our real data. 
all splits result in the same number of misclassification errors. Now, instead of counting misclassification errors, let's try out our new strategy, measuring the resulting impurity of our nodes after each split. One way to measure the impurity of each node alone is as the fraction of minority class examples. Using this metric, a node with only positive or only negative examples would have zero impurity, since the fraction of a minority class is zero. Alternatively, the most impure node possible, a node with exactly half positive and half negative examples, would have an impurity of one half. Finally, between these extremes, the fraction of our minority class changes linearly. A node with three positive and one negative examples has an impurity of one fourth. Let's express our impurity measure as a mathematical function. We'll call it i of p, where p is the fraction of positive examples in our node. One way to express the metric we've come up with here, the minority class fraction, is as the minimum of p and 1 minus p. Now, before we begin computing, note that there are, of course, other ways we could measure the impurity of our nodes. We have no deep reason to believe that this is the one right strategy. We're really just trying out ideas that seem reasonable. This actually happens all the time in machine learning. But fortunately, practitioners have developed a name for this sort of thing, so it actually sounds like we know what we're talking about. Heuristics. Our minority class fraction measure of impurity, I of P, is a heuristic. A simple and practical, but perhaps not optimal approach to our problem of finding the best split. Let's go ahead and compute the impurities for each of our two nodes across our splits. Since each split results in two impurity numbers, one for each node, we need some way of putting these numbers together into a single metric. We could simply take the average, but since one node could have more examples than the other, this could throw our metric out of balance. So it's probably a better idea to take a weighted average, where the weights correspond to the fraction of all examples that end up in each node. Let's call the fraction of examples that end up in our left node alpha. Since the fraction of all examples that end up in each of our two nodes must add up to one, the fraction of examples that end up in our right node will be equal to one minus alpha. So for our x1 split, since two of our five examples end up in our left node, we'll use a weight or alpha of two-fifths. Our remaining three examples end up in our right node, making the weight for this node equal to three-fifths, or one minus alpha. After some fun fraction adding, we end up with a total impurity of two-fifths for this split. We can now use our complete impurity heuristic, the weighted average of our node impurities, to determine which split is best. Let's compute our overall impurity for each split, and we'll choose the split with the lowest value. Our second split yields an impurity of two-fifths, suspiciously matching the impurity of our first split, which is especially strange considering that our left node is completely pure. And if we compute the impurity of our third and fourth splits, we see the same deflating result. Somehow, after all that work, we're right back where we started. All splits appear equally good. Clearly, our heuristic is not doing the job we designed it for. But why? Why does taking the weighted average of the impurity of each node take us right back to where we started? It turns out that we're missing one final key piece of the puzzle. There's one critical change we need to make to our node impurity heuristic that will make all the difference. And of all the ideas we've picked up from our machine learning and statistics researchers, this one is the most subtle but also the most powerful. Although implemented in different ways in the statistics and machine learning communities, this minor change to our heuristic was the key discovery that allowed decision trees to quickly and effectively learn patterns from data. Next time, we'll implement this discovery.